Okay, great. Many thanks for taking part. Um, please tell me how you came into television. Uh, I got a job at London Weekend as uh, a researcher. Um, I've been a journalist in my early life. I've been there and gone on to university. I then went and did other things. Yeah. And I then wanted to go somewhere where I could do serious, some serious work. And so I went, I, got, I was very lucky to get a job as a researcher at London Weekend Television. How tough was it to do that? What, to get the job? Yeah. Um, I had a mate who worked there who made sure I got onto the short list. Um, and then it was a strange interviewing process, but it, I, mean, I was 30 at the time. Uh, and I, got, I applied for a job on a programme called Weekend World and eventually got a job on a programme called The London Programme. What were your earliest observations of the television industry? Well, um, I joined London Weekend Television at a time when uh, its current affairs department was growing pretty rapidly. It did a particular sort of current affairs, which I still believe was very valid, which was try to understand what a subject is about. And if you see a problem, try to explain what could be done about it as opposed to just that style of current affairs that says, isn't everything terrible, see you next week. What were the biggest changes that took place in the 1980s that you experienced? Um, well, when you look back at that period, um, I mean, 1960 to to 1990 looks pretty tame compared to what happened afterwards. Uh, when did Channel 4 came? 1982. Then it was Breakfast. Yeah. And then it was Sky. Yeah. Right, let's do it again. Well, the, the period, say, the 60s changed television quite dramatically because the BBC invented what I would call quality popular programming, uh, you know, from from Z cars to uh, Stepto to all that sort of thing, that sort of programming. And turned around, I mean, if you go back to 1960, you know, ITV was, was the dominant broadcaster in popular terms. By the 10 years later, they weren't. Uh, the BBC had changed the whole landscape of television by creating uh, British popular programming. And, and, and what it meant for the next, 20 years was the amount of American material on British television went into a pretty sharp decline. The 80s was a different period because the 80s came with um, Channel 4, Breakfast Television, and then, of course, Sky and multi-channel television. And that was, it didn't seem it at the time, but actually it was a pretty dramatic change and had an impact on what came afterwards. What do you think the impact of satellite television has been? Um, well, the coming of, of, of satellite with multi-channel television has been, has had a, a, an enormous impact, particularly on uh, ITV. Um, it's changed, uh, we should have seen it coming. Uh, we should have known what impact it had because you could see that impact it had with cable in America. Um, but those of us who were working, say, in ITV at the time, thought we could see it off. And instead of changing our whole strategy to embrace it and to get to be part of it, we thought we could see it off, which was a big mistake. What was the impact of the 1990 Broadcast Act and the auctioning of ITV licences? Well, uh, um, the auctioning of the licences was the sort of, it really was, you know, shutting the stable door after the horse had, horse had bolted. So it's only ever happened that one time. Some quite good companies lost, some um, pretty average companies won. Um, but of course, not soon after that, you got 
the whole change in the ownership rules and everything else. So that, you know, ITV, it was, you were still hanging on to this idea that there were 15 regions and, 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 and that was a, that was only possible because of the monopoly that ITV had had. The monopoly was going and the, the franchise auction was a sort of throwback to the past really and was irrelevant by the time it happened but it didn't it didn't help ITV uh, it helped some of us I mean I you know I, I I was running London Weekend at the time we did we did very well we won London Weekend we won breakfast television and we won one um, we bought a chunk of Yorkshire television at a later stage because we'd been one of the successful ones but if I tell you we bid 11 million and one, and the people bidding against us bid 32 million and lost. It was a rather strange process. What do you think about breakfast television these days? Um, I think breakfast television today is pretty dull. Um, I don't think it's, um, when it started, of course there were very few people watching and the first people there were women and children, uh, mothers with children often. Um, and it was quite interesting and quite innovative. I think today it's pretty dull. I don't think it's very exciting. I think the BBC show is aimed at over 65s and the ITV show is lost, doesn't know what it is. What's been the impact of 24 hour news? I think there is a problem of 24-hour news. I think it was inevitable, but I think there is a problem, and that is every story has to be exciting, every story has to be breaking news, when often nothing's happening. And every so often you watch... I mean, I'll never forget the, the one where the ticker type said, Prime Minister leaves Downing Street. A ticker across the bottom of the... He got in his car and gone out of Downing Street. I mean, that's not news, that's just. And 24-hour news is brilliant when there's a really big story. But for a lot of the time, it's tedious. What has happened to the coverage of sport in the last 20 years on TV? Well, sport has become, well, think again. When people ask, why have we not got home box office, a home box office in this country? Why are we not making that sort of brilliant drama paid for by paid television? The answer is because we gave all that money to footballers. And with the coming of Sky and the coming of paid television, they chose the business model of football, which has been enormously successful for Sky and for football. But it does mean million, billions, really, that came in through pay television was not spent on drama. It was handed over to footballers. Do you think too much money is being spent on sports coverage? Well, it's a market. It's a market. Um, Sky couldn't live without um, football, mm. which is why now enormous sums are paid. If anyone had told you when they set up the Premier League that 20 odd years later, they'd be getting the sort of sums they get. No one would have believed it. Um, so it's, it's been, for sport overall, well, there are certain sports that, that television really wants and the rest have got left behind. Yeah, but I mean, it has put a lot of money into sport. But you see things like cricket, where A lot of money is spent, uh, and cricket needs that money, but it's damaging cricket because it's not on it's not on terrestrial television. It's only on satellite television, and your audiences for sport are much lower on ter on satellite television than terrestrial television. You've only I always remember when the England Wales rugby match one year was obviously in Cardiff, one year in Twickenham. The year it was in Twickenham, it was on Sky and got audiences of about a million. And the following year it was on the BBC and got audiences of six and seven million. I mean, uh, so, so 
sport on television has become a business. Uh, the BBC, which always had a reputation for great sport on television, has struggled to keep up because it just hasn't got enough money. What's your view about the state of ITV today? I think ITV today, I think ITV, I think ITV has had a very difficult period. I think ITV in the first decade of this century was not particularly well run. I think they failed to respond to competition. Um, but I think in, in recent years it's it's done better because it's worked out what its position is in this market. But I mean, if you think of, you go back to when I first worked in ITV, which was the dominant commercial broadcaster, it's nothing like that now. What's your view about the state of Channel 4 today? Well, Channel 4 has gone the same way as most, as all broadcasters, you know, they've all lost audience. Now, if you're the BBC and you manage to keep the license fee, that's fine. If you're Channel 4 or ITV, you just lost, losing audience means you're losing revenue. Uh, and I think as a result, it, Channel 4 is not what you'd say was the radical, interesting, racy uh, channel it was. But that was probably inevitable in a world of much greater competition. Do you think it should be privatised? Um, I, I don't think it makes much difference. I think if, if you did privatise uh, Channel 4, I would, private, I would turn it into a trust. Uh, I think it should be a public trust or something like that. I don't think it would make much difference to what Channel 4 is. And if it was turned into a trust, it would have to retain its remit, would you well, say? I, it would be silly to lose its remit because yeah. um, its remit is very commercial. I mean, it's, I mean, what people didn't understand when Channel 4 first, 4 first started was that if you could get the young, as they did early on, then that was commercially very attractive, as opposed to, you know, you, you've got to look at television as it, commercial television as it was. I mean, um, advertisers would pay large sums of money to get the right sort of audience. Channel 4 delivered that sort of audience. So once they started selling their own advertising, it became um, immensely successful for a period. What's your view about the state of Channel 5 today? Um, channel, I mean, uh, Channel 5 came into existence at a very difficult time. Uh, and it had to cope with that. It had to cope with uh, much, much greater competition. It's survived. I don't think it's something that you could be particularly proud of, but it's survived. What's happened to the Indies? Well, I think the coming of the independent sector changed television dramatically. Some of it to, to, its good, to, to the benefit of television and some of it not. To the benefit of television, suddenly a lot more people are working on new ideas, thinking up new ideas, and trying to sell them in. And that's been to the benefit of television. I think many successful Channel 4 programmes are being sold overseas by the independent producers, whereas they wouldn't have been if they belonged to Channel 4 or the BBC International, all those sorts of things. And I think that's to the good of television. But I do think it has meant that money has come to dominate television in a way that it wouldn't have done 30 years ago. Um, when I first got a job in television, if you had a good idea, you got a buzz that it was on the television. Today, if you've got a good idea, your major aim is how do I maximise my income from it? And I'm not sure that's to the benefit of television. I think with the independence and with Channel 4 also came the commissioning editor system, which I think has been quite damaging to television. I think too many people are now involved in a decision of whether a programme hits the air or not. And I think that has, I think often, there's a lack of trust that actually what, 
I made a television program one time about HBO and why had HBO in America been so successful? How they how did they turn HBO from a, a channel that did um, old movies and boxing into something that did some of the best drama in the world? And it's in the end you rooted it down. They trusted the creatives. So if someone went in with an idea for a series, they said yes, they let it go, they then trust the creatives. I think the commissioning editor system we've got in this country means that the creatives, are, there's, there's a double guessing of creatives all the time. And my view is television would be far better to say, look, you just made a great series, make us another one. Tell us what you're on about and make it. And if it doesn't work, then we'll move on to someone else. But this idea that you've got often other than commissioning editors in creative terms are less talented than the producers and directors are making the shows and that can't be in anybody's interest. Do you think the Let a Thousand Flowers Bloom philosophy of the 80s is dead? Well, there's, there's many more channels, so there's many more outlets. Um, but of course they haven't really got the money. A lot of them haven't got the money. So, I mean, programming is much cheaper than it was because of the technological change, so it's cheaper to make. But um, I think it was probably inevitable that television would hit a stage where maybe it wasn't novel anymore, it wasn't new anymore, people were less interested. It's got middle-aged. Yeah, got middle-aged, I think that's right. And I think, uh, when I look now, what do I watch on television? Not a lot. News, events, sport. Middle range programming has got lost. So uh, if you look at what's happened say, to Saturday nights, you know, strictly X Factor, X Factor I think is now gradually going, but strictly big success, massive budget, big event, live, and I think that's what's happened. Um, you know, I, I don't think. Uh, I think I, I think those big live shows, like big sports events, like big event shows, work. Mm. I don't think the the average show from the night of what was the average in the seventies and eighties wouldn't work now. Um, what do you think about the state of investigative journalism on TV? Is it dead? And there's still some good investigative journalism, but most of it's a bit of it's on Channel Four, and the rest of it's on the BBC. Um, Is it dying? Um, well, as budgets got tighter, so uh, it became investigative journalism became more difficult. But you still see some brilliant pieces. Um, I watched, oh, I don't know, probably a year ago, Peter Taylor's piece mm. on Iraq. And it was, you know, where he found the original sources of all sorts of information and discovered that they'd all lied. Mm -hmm. um, it was brilliant, and I still think that happens. But it's like so much on television, there's so much of it now, that actually it's harder to have an impact. Um, do you think that economics are causing a form of self-censorship on British television? Let me give you an example. If you're an indie these days, you know what the broadcaster wants. Uh, he wants one type of product, entertainment, at a price they're willing to pay. So the indies give it to them, little or nothing else. Do you recognise that syndrome? Well, I've met indies who complain that they had a great idea. They went into selling one of the three ideas and the broadcaster chose the worst one. Uh, now that's their view. I, I'm a great believer in letting creatives, if they've got a good idea, make it and see what happens. Uh, and I think the commissioning editor system has been quite damaging in that regard. I think there's a lack of trust uh, between the creatives and, and the commissioning editors. Why is that? Um, I suspect the com because failure, it's quite difficult to fail now. Uh, there's many more people looking at you, there's many more people sitting on top of you trying to say why did that fail. So, and commissioning editors are often not as talented as the producers. 
and is, the directors. Is there a fear as well where the Indies are concerned that their ideas are going to just be stolen? Um, well, there was always that idea. I mean, when I was first when I was first in television, if you interview if you interview for a job, you'd ask mm. people their ideas, and you'd mm. quite regularly say, "Well, he wasn't very good, was he? But that was a great idea. We'll pinch that." Mm. Now, you, today, people are much more protective of their ideas because mm. they think, "I can make money out of this." You know, always remember the girl who, who had the original, just a gleam of an idea for Strictly, mm. was given a five thousand pound bonus. If she'd done it for an indie, she would have made millions. Um, investigative journalism and the economics of self-censorship, do you recognise this syndrome? It's expensive, it causes trouble, it gets low audiences, so don't do it. Not dead, but dying. Well, when I was first in television working, I mean, you know, causing trouble was what we were there for. Um, you know, I think, you know, we were there to... to find programs that caused, had a bit of an impact and caused a bit of trouble. Mm. Um, is, that, is that dying? Well, you've got to remember there was a battle between news and current affairs, mm. and it was been won by news. Mm. So the money got shifted to news, and news isn't really brave most of the time, it just churns it out. Mm. Mm. Um, the BBC. What were your impressions when you joined the BBC as Director General? Um, I thought what was quite a simple idea had been made desperately complicated. Uh, and therefore, a lot of my time as Director General, we were trying to simplify it back. Um, you know, that's why I did a, in my McTaggart lecture of that year, I said it's about, it's the, I pinched Bill Clinton's line, you know, it's the program, stupid. That in the end, you can run a wonderful organisation, but if the programmes are rubbish, what's the point? And it's about the programmes. And the more you could bang on, I banged on about that, which I thought, you know, my predecessor didn't have that sort of credibility because they didn't think he was a programme maker, although actually he was a very good programme maker. So when I got there, I decided we had to talk about the programmes. And when you say it got too complicated, it, what were they doing if they weren't making programmes at your time? Well, someone said to me, I remember very early on, someone said to me, this is a very complicated place, you know, it'll take you a long, long time to understand how this, how this works and how it operates. And, that and uh, I said, it doesn't seem very complicated to me. Someone gives me three and a half billion pounds a year and I spend it. Um, you know, most places I'd been, it was getting the three and a half billion that was the difficult bit. So I, I thought they may, the, the BBC, I'm a great believer in the BBC, I'm a great believer, and always have been, you know, even when I was working for commercial television, I, I, I was a great believer that, in the famous Michael Grade words, you know, it kept us all honest, mm. that actually, um, spending a lot of money on original British television meant the commercial sector had to do the same. Um, which is why we've got a much bigger television industry than we have film industry, because same France, they spent the money on film. Here we spent it on television. So, uh, and that led to the growth of a big television industry, initially in the broadcasters, but since then outside. When you were Director General, did you think the BBC was too big? Um, when I first got there, someone again said to me, how do you want it to feel? I said, I'd like it to feel smaller. Um, I certainly took out layers of management. Um, but I didn't feel it wasn't manageable. I didn't feel, but you did have to spend a lot more time um, getting people on side than say in a small ITV company when you were based in one based in one building. I mean the BBC was harder than that. It, me it meant a lot of your time if you're the leader had to be spent out there talking to people and getting to know them. Finding out what they wanted. But I didn't think it was too big, no. Do you think it's too big today? No. Did you think it was inefficient? All big organisations are inefficient. Uh, you have to, in the end, there is, 
there was bound to be a degree of inefficiency, but if you'd looked at IBM at that time, or if you'd looked at Marks and Spencer at that time, all organisations, all big organisations are, are comparatively inefficient, which is why they always get beaten in the end by small organisations coming round in the back. Um, but I didn't think it was grossly inefficient, no. What view did you form about the licence fee? Um, Well, when I was at the BBC, we invented f we invented Freeview. Uh, I mean, it was the classic case where two of us sat in an office. Mm. Myself and Carolyn Fairbairn, who was my head of strategy, invented Freeview. Mm. Uh, we saw the opportunity, we grabbed it, and we got it going. But of course, what Freeview m could have meant was that you could have switched BBC from the licence fee to pay television, because you could have put a chip in every one of those boxes. Um, I came to the conclusion that actually the single most important thing about the BBC is universality, that it's available to everyone. It's even available to the people who don't pay the licence fee. I mean, they can, get, they can get in trouble for it, but they can still see it. And I think a universal service in a world where, where fragmentation was happening amongst broadcasters on a, on a major scale, I thought um, a universal service was very important. And I think the BBC is more important now than at any time in its history because of, because of that fragmentation of a marketplace. The BBC still is still the dominant player. Do you have any regrets about your handling of the Today programme report by Andrew Gilligan on the dodgy dossier? Well, there are always a few regrets, but by and large, I think history has shown we were right. I think I don't, it's very hard to meet anybody today who doesn't think that Blair and Co didn't sex up the dossier and didn't, didn't sex up the case for war. Um, but you could have, could we have dealt with it differently? Yes. Would it have made much difference? Probably not. If Dr. Kelly hadn't killed himself, the story would have just died like all stories die in the end. It was only Dr. Kelly's suicide or alleged suicide. Um, that that changed the whole game. And really, it was, when after that had happened, it was really out of out of our control. What I do think we made a mistake was when when um, Lord Hutton was appointed. We should have said, no, that's not fair. You've got to have more than one judge, and you can't have a judge who's 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 been very close over the years to the security services, because. In the end, the whole thing was about the security services and their relationship with the government of the day. When the Hutton report was published, couldn't the BBC have slapped it down saying it beggars belief that the government was right about everything, the BBC wrong about everything? We did say that a bit, but we didn't need to because the media said that. I mean, Hutton was... Hutton... I mean, I remember talking to... Uh, Labour government ministers that weekend and they're saying we don't know what to do. Hutton came out and completely absolved us of all blame and we're still getting the blame. Well they're getting the blame because they deserved it. You know there is no doubt now when you look back Tony Blair didn't tell the truth. Now you could argue he didn't tell the truth on all sorts of things but he certainly didn't tell the truth when he said he wasn't the man who had allowed uh, Dr. Kelly's name to be released to the press, because he was. And that's now conclusively proved. What do you think the future holds for the BBC? Um, I think that the BBC itself needs to be a bit more on the front foot, it needs to be braver, it needs to... Uh, but I think uh, the BBC will be fine. I think there's a bunch of us who will stat, who will get together and fight for it. The Conservatives haven't got a very large majority. Why did why did Mrs. Thatcher never really take on the BBC? And the answer, because most of the people who loved the BBC were her supporters. Uh, look at the strength of the BBC in the south of England, outside London. 
where they're virtually all conservative seats. I mean, I was, I was director of programmes at Television South at one time, which covered the whole of, you know, Dorset, Hampshire, Sussex, Surrey, all that, that area. And we didn't have, a, for one period, we didn't have a single Labour MP. Everybody was conservative. And yet the ratings for the BBC there were enormous. I think, I think if this government thinks they're going to take on the BBC and destroy it, they're in for a big, big shock and they'll back off. What do you think the future of the BBC should be? Sorry, <clears throat> what do you think the future of the BBC should be in terms of its size, scope and role? Well, come back to your earlier question, because I didn't really answer it about the licence fee. I think it's, I think, the, the thing about the licence fee is it doesn't belong to the politicians, it belongs to the public. And I think one of the things the BBC has failed to stand up and say enough in recent years is, excuse me, we're not paid for by you, we're paid for by the public. So to the governments of the day. I mean, it is inevitable. If you go back and read Grace Wyndham Goldie, who, who saw the BBC through the Suez crisis, and ever since, the, the, it is inevitable that there's going to be conflict between the BBC and government of the day, Labour or Tory, it makes no difference. Because they want only their view of the world to be seen. I remember writing to Tony Blair, who wrote and complained to me about our, our coverage leading up to the Iraq war. And I wrote back and just said, I'm sorry, Prime Minister, but you cannot be the arbiter of impartiality because you're not impartial. And the BBC's major aim is to be impartial. We've gone to enormous lengths during the run up to the Iraq war to try to be impartial, which was very difficult because on phone in programmes and things like that, people in favour of the war didn't phone in. So we'd extended the number, we'd done all the sorts of things, but still, Blair pushed by Alistair Campbell believe we'd been impartial we hadn't been impartial and I wrote to him and said I'm saying you can't be the judge you've got thousands of your of people and millions of people on the streets protesting you've got half your party voting against you you cannot be the judge and of course as it's turned out I mean, the Iraq war was one of the great disasters of post-war Britain um, I'd like to ask you some questions now about the Savile Affair, um, how damaging was the decision to, um, to drop um, the Savile investigation conducted by Newsnight into allegations of historical sex abuse? Well, it was clearly a mistake. I don't think it's the most devastating decision. Uh, in the end, I don't believe it was taken by anybody up there, and that's the good conspiracy theory, you know, that someone up there said, oh, Jimmy Savile, we've got another programme about him, we don't, he was a much loved figure at the BBC, and I said, God, we mustn't let this go out. I just don't believe that would happen. When I was Director General, if, if, if that had been around, and, and it wasn't, but if that had been around, the one thing I, you would know is if you in any way tried to interfere it would have been all over the newspapers tomorrow and quite likely. So I just don't believe the conspiracy theories that a decision was taken at the top to stop this. I think the decision was taken by the editor of Newsnight. I think it would have been a very difficult programme. I don't think Newsnight is equipped to do that sort of programme. It hasn't got the resources. What should have happened was that they should have handed it all over to Panorama and said look here's an interesting I start, here's some interesting material, why don't you go to it? But of course, as you know only too well, you know, the people on Newsnight and the people on Panorama by and large hate each other. Because that's that's their that's the rival. And therefore they would never do, but that's what they should have done. So why didn't they shelve it? Why did they drop it? I don't know. You'd have to ask the editor you'd have to ask the editor of of Newsnight. I suspect he didn't have the resource to do it. Uh, the police didn't take it up didn't take up the complaints. And I suspect he thought wrongly that it was too difficult to do. With the benefit of hindsight, do you think it should have been um, delayed, but they should have continued to make investigations and then when they were ready to publish? No, I think they should have handed it over to Panorama. But I think what the, the issue of Savile is much, much bigger than whether or not Newsnight should have run the programme. Do you think that 
the subconscious was at work, that somehow or other it just felt deeply uncomfortable to who knows whom, um, but various people in the BBC to the point where they just didn't want to pursue it. No, I think that's the conspiracy theory that I just don't believe. I think it might have been difficult for the editor of Newsnight, but in the end it was his decision, it would have been his decision. Seriously, the BBC didn't, but the, the power in the BBC is, is well down, as it should be in an organisation as big as the BBC. The power of what goes on and what doesn't go on is well down. I mean, for instance, I'll give you an example. At the time of Dr Kelly's uh, performances before the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee and things like that, Newsnight had a tape which they'd made the same day of an interview with Dr Kelly, which by and large supported everything Gilligan said. They didn't tell us. They said, this is ours, this belongs to, this belongs to Newsnight, it doesn't belong to, to you. And I, as you can imagine, I was quite upset annoyed when I found out, but that shows you they did not regard themselves as subservient to someone up there at the BBC, up at the top of the BBC. Would you have expected, had you been Director General at the time of the Newsnight investigation, to have been informed um, about its progress and the decision to drop it? No. No. Um, that wouldn't have been at the level of the Director General at any stage, I don't think. Um, the number of times a programme came to me as Director General was quite small. Knowing what you now know, and having read the Pollard report, as, as I have, um, would you um, like to think that as Director General you would have run it? had that material been presented to you? Well, it's, it's a hypothetical position because um, it wasn't presented to the director general. But if it had been, I'd have, think, I'd have said, are you, you know, can you stand this up? Are you content with it? Is it good enough? Do the lawyers agree it? If you've got all those things, then you'd run it. But I suspect you wouldn't have got all those things because I don't think the editor of, of News and I was content with it. I think he had doubts. Do you think that um, the Director General, George Entwistle, was right to resign? Um, my view was that George Entwistle had been appointed. He was the chairman's candidate, Chris Patton. He'd been appointed by Chris Patton. And I think he was then hung out to, hung out to dry by Chris Patton. Because? Well, I don't. I, the job of a. Ch in organisations, when the going gets rough, the job of the chairman is either to support and be close to the chief executive um, or to decide he has to go. In this case, I don't. Th having appointed uh, Endwistle, it was Patton's job was to be in with him every day, talking to him, supporting him, seeing how to get him through, giving him some advice, and that's, and that's not what happened. He's a, he was fundamentally a politician, and politicians at times of difficulty run for the hills, and that's what he did. Therefore, I think Entwistle was hung out to dry, um, but I think he probably found the pressure intolerable. Um, one last question. Um, you, when we spoke on the phone um, yeah, yesterday, um, you made a point that you wanted to make about um, uh, American television in relation to the UK. Would you like to What was that? I saying? I think you were saying something to the effect of that um, it seems strange that the UK has allowed itself to have so much American um, ownership of its media assets. Oh, yeah, well, it always struck me as interesting that um, well, there's, sorry, there's something interesting about the independent sector, that as they get to a certain stage in size in this country, instead of building up to an enormous size, they sell out to Americans. And 
that's not only to be found in the television industry, but it is an interesting question. And why is it, do you think? I don't know. Why is it when someone's made, can make 10 or 15 million, they say, fine, I'll sell out now, I'll have a comfortable life. Mm. Instead of saying, I want to build this into the biggest independent production company in the world. Yeah. Um, I don't know why it happens. It doesn't only happen in television, it happens in the games industry, it happens in film. It happens, I suspect, in many industries in this country, but it is a fundamental problem for Britain. Um, there's one more question I should ask you, which is about the internet. Yes. Um, bearing in mind uh, your comments about um, the nature and fabric of um, the television of today, what is the uh, impact of the internet? Do you think internet will kill television? Um, what do you think? I don't think television will be killed. I, th I think television has got quite a good future, but it certainly changes. Um, I don't think the internet kills it because I don't think the internet will ever give the investment into uh, British production that the British broadcasters can and will. Uh, I don't think it will... The, the hardest problem about the internet is about marketing. How does anyone know what it is, where it is, how do they find it? Uh, so I do think television still has quite a healthy future, uh, but it has changed. I mean, it'll be... The middle road program doesn't work anymore. You've got to be up there. It's got to be top rank. It's got to. Be, that's why live programming works if it's special. Uh, it's why good drama still works. But the days when you could make cheap drama have gone. Uh, that works. Um, soap. It's very hard to launch a new soap now. Um, and, and gradually the audience declines. But I don't think we are living through the death of television, which is what some people think. I, I think they're premature. I think it's a, got a long run yet. Great. Many, many thanks. Thank you. Excellent. Um, brilliant. Um, just to be clear about Savile, because I don't think